In this video we'll be forming the logic that will determine whether or not the stand solution shown is in equilibrium, uh, if it will fall over and just how stable it is. Get a feel for how um, stable that is. We're going to first work out what the least stable loading condition is for the stand, find the axis about which it will then be most unstable and then finally work out the lever arm and weight for each coat and timber element to that axis. So firstly we're going to add in a list length component. And then we're going to plug in the latest form of our geometry into that division. Divide it by two. Because I know that the least stable condition for this coat stand will be when only half of it is loaded. When when there are coats, let's say there are 10 hooks, when five of them are used and only on one side. Maybe that's a bit unrealistic, but we've got to take worst case scenario here. Uh, and then we're going to round that down. So round to decimal place, round to decimal place. We're we'll plugging in whatever number that is. And let's, let's just say there are 11 um, coat hooks and we get 5.5 .5 out of here, what we really want, oh we've got 6.5 here, 6 here haven't we? We want that to show 6 because we want all of them to be on one side of the centroid. So let's have 0 for the decimal place and 1 for the rounding type. So 1 is floor, so we want to round down never round up in this situation uh, and then we're going to split the list oh, sorry we're, that's the index in which we're splitting the list uh, the actual list we're splitting is th these coats <clears throat> so let's put in a geometry bin just to see exactly what this is doing there we go. Can you see that? That we've got one which is splitting. We're splitting the index six. So we will get six items there in A and we'll get seven items in B. We want the six because we know that all of those are on one side of the centroid. OK, so let's label this and uh, actually let's flatten it too, because if we plug in a panel here, we'll see that it's pushed up. That component has pushed up all the data a tree level and we don't want that. Coats in the least balanced condition. There we are. We can delete this. We don't need that or that. And let's flatten. Okay. So the next thing is we want to find the tipping point. So let's split the data again. This time we want to split the available hooking points in two. Okay. And the index again will be the same. So we don't need to move that. And then we want the first and the last points. Plug that in here. So we've split it, which if I grab a point bin, oh dear, if I grab a point bin and plug in our information, we're splitting as we as we did with the coats over here, we're splitting the points that the um, coats are hooked onto and we're taking the smaller value. And then we're gonna find the final and last point. Okay, so these are essentially these are the extents of the weight that we're placing on the stand. And then we're going to draw a line between those. So the first and the last. There we go. So this is creating our essentially the axis plane over which the um, over which our loading is symmetrical. 
and then we're going to create a cluster so this is the first time we're coming across a cluster I'll try to take you slowly through this we want to find the midpoint of this line and there is no function native to grasshopper to find the midpoint of any given line it's quite a simple series of commands but this demonstrates the application of making your own component for the first time so let's type in endpoints and then addition and we're going to add any line that we plug into this component um, find its start and endpoint vectors we're going to add them together and divide them by two. Okay, and what that will do is find the midpoint. So it's nice and simple. But if we go to our, uh, I forget where this is. Okay, so the parameters tab, and you'll find you've got two arrows. You've got an input. A cluster input and you've got a cluster output so we want one of each of those cluster input at the beginning and a cluster output at the end and connect them up and that's necessary for us to um, for, for grasshopper to understand what we are intending to create as the inputs and outputs and then we're going to highlight this right click and click on cluster and you can see immediately what that's done is that's create that's that's created one function one component which does a several which completes a, ser a series of um, functions much like anything else we've got in the script but it's nice and tidy isn't it so I've already done this in subsequent um, scripts for you but now you've made one and in order to save that and make sure that it's available for future um, scripts we can click on file create user object and we can say okay find midpoint midpoint of line and you can fill all this information out if you like you can give it a unique shape you can upload your own shape if you like to make it um, a bit more visible so once you click OK you will see a users folder users tab and in here I've already got a few but I've deleted some of them we should have um, what we just typed in find midpoint of line and there we go we have exactly the same function with clusters you can edit them if you like so if I double left click in that here we see what's actually going on behind the scenes and I can add more items move things around comment on them flatten etc and then if I want to leave I can save it and close and that will be updated so we've made there our curves and midpoints I want to rename this just to make it a bit clearer there and right click and this will be midpoints and then we have our user object so hopefully there we are we've got the midpoint of that long line there which we wanted next we're going to pull this point to the base pull point that in there and then we're going to first actually I want to get the base the, the bottom circle so let's have let's grab the geometry of the base down here so remember we extruded from the top to the bottom and it probably doesn't really matter to be honest but let's just say for argument's sake we're just wanting to recreate that so actually we can take uh, this Z vector Let's disconnect and we're going to plug it into the depth of the stand depth of the base sorry whoops but we want to move it in an opposite direction so x multiplied by negative 1 
There we go. And I'm sure you've already thought of a quick way of doing that, which is great. I would hope that you would be able to make improvements to this script. There's lots of scope for that. Okay, so now we have found the tipping point. And if I try and rotate this, you'll see that, yeah, okay, if I hide all of the coats, Uh, we'll do that later. If if I were to if I were to only select the coats that were um, going to cause this to tip, it would be these over here. They are going to tip along this axis, and the point respective on the base is here. Great. So let's say find the point of rotation on the base for this group. Okay, next we're just going to find the plane, the tipping plane. So let's choose a subtract component there. Um, input A is going to be the point at the base. Input B is going to be the midpoint. And what we want to do here is just to find the horizontal distance between this line and that point. So that we can shift it to on plan a position where the tipping point actually is. So we're going to deconstruct that. And then we're going to construct a point. But I'm going to leave out the Z coordinate. Then I'm going to use that vector to, in, to, to, to basically move the um, this top line. That's the geometry. That's the direction. And we can see now, if I were to move this on plan, if I were to show you on plan, what I've done is I've moved the line indicating the extent of the load so we know about which plane everything is rotating and we've moved that to the location of the tipping point on plan exactly hopefully you can see that and then i'm just going to extend that curve here we are by say 500 millimeters at each end So this is a bit longer. Great. So this is the tipping plane. Then we want to know the lever arm of each of the coats to that plane. Essentially we're looking bang on around there and we want to find each of those points and how far they are away from the, the um, tipping plane. So Let's grab the center point. Let's make two points, actually. Two point bins. One is going to be the center point of the hoop. One is going to be the hook points. Right. Let's move these over a little bit. Make a bit of space. And our center point, if we can find it, <laughs> is going to be right back over here in our stand information is this one there we are i unhide this you'll see yeah right at the top of the stand so we want that point and then all our hooking points get our hooking points these are taken from this same output here but i'm going to create a little relay there so that I can just grab it. And maybe I'll include that in the group. So what we're going to do with these two points is use them to discover whether or not each point that's translated from a hooking point to the to the axis of, of 
to the tipping axis, it, whether, whether or not that's on the right or the left. Now, because we know that all of our um, coats in the unstable position are to the right of the center point of the stand, they're all on one side, and we know that that's, if I indicate with my mouse, that's all on this side of that center point, then when we're measuring, we can measure the distance between the translated point onto this line and the center point, and we can compare that to the distance between the translated point and the original hook, hooking point. Um, and if the if the distance is larger, we know that actually that's coming from the right hand side of the line. If we know the distance is smaller, we know that the hooking point is coming from the left hand side. Hopefully that will make more sense as we actually create the code and you'll see what's happening. It might be worth actually showing just the coats that we're considering under this, under this equation. Um, the coats that we're considering are coming from A, so let's just put a geometry bin in there so we can hide all of them and only see the ones we're interested in. Yeah, so these are the coats that are in the least stable position. These are the ones that we're concerning ourselves with at the moment. So we've got the center point, the hook points, and now we're going to pull each of these hooking points to the line that we generated earlier, which we know is the tipping line. So now we've got three sets, haven't we? We've got three, three sets of information. We've got the center point, which is we're going to be able to measure the distance to. We've got our hooking points around here, and we've got the pulled respective points. So let's let's put in two pieces of um, logic here. Oh, it's not measure, is it? Sorry, it's distance. We want two of those. The first thing we're going to measure is the distance between the center point and the point that's been pulled. So for instance, for this top coat here, we're going to measure the distance between this point and the center here. And then we're going to measure the, the distance between the center point and the original location of that point. So for this coat, it will be the distance between this center point and the original. And hopefully you can already see if I do that, if I put that on plan, hopefully you can see that this distance is going to be longer than this distance. And it will only be the case where the uh, point in question is on the left. If the point in question was on the right of that axis, then it would be smaller, wouldn't it? So therefore we have some logic that we can apply to the data and separate it out, which is on the left and which is on the right. So I'm going to type in larger and plug in those two measurements. So we would expect for this first coat here in the list, we would expect that the distance between the center point and the translated, the pulled point, let's put it in here, we would expect that distance to be larger than the distance between the hooking point and the center. And if that is true, and they're in the right order, the first one should be true, which it, it is. And we see that for all five locations. We're going to use that um, patterned logic to dispatch. So type in dispatch. And what we want is to dispatch the points. No, we don't, sorry, the distance. As we're calculating here the lever arm. And we're going to calculate the lever arm in meters. At the moment, the information on the canvas is in millimeters. So let's right click and multiply x. Uh, by one, sorry, divide x by 1000. So now we're in meters. Yeah, there we go, we can see that. Uh, and then the dispatch pattern is this pattern here, so we're going to plug that in too. And we should see that we have three lengths, two lengths that are shorter and four lengths which are longer and what I can do 
to demonstrate what this is doing is um, move the base increase the size of the base so you'll be able to see that line moving and hopefully all of the logic will be on one side so let's just increase the diameter of the base oh and no let's 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 reduce it so we can see when the base is that size all of the coat hooking hooking points will be on one side of our tipping axis and we should expect to see that reflected in our logic here which we do let's move that back to a sensible size now so two in four out okay right so now we have our two lists and we'll continue with that information later but let's label it now finding the lever arms of the coats okay we're getting there so with our timber components we have to adapt that logic slightly because we have timber components on both sides of the symmetric axis um, and they're not necessarily always contributing to the same um, tipping moment so let's get a geometry bin in here and we're going to collect all of the geometry from the stand that we allow to pass through with our data gate that we created last time. So we're picking that up and then we're going to find the volume and the centroids for each of these. And in order to get the volume and the centroids, we only need one component, the volume one. Um, with all the centroids, we're going to create a point. Uh, so we're going to deconstruct a point. And construct one again without differentiating the Z level and we're going to move that to a plane move to plane so those points going to be moved and what, what I'm doing here is because of the symmetry of the um, of the um, problem really it doesn't matter the height doesn't matter the height of the centroid doesn't matter when we're, we're working out what the overall moment is here so I'm going to put them all in one plane and measure the horizontal distance to that plane at one location here so have we got our center points and our Yeah, let's grab our center point again. Copy that. And bring that down here. We also want another point which is coming from the middle of our um, axis line. So that's coming from here. Okay. We're going to subtract the two and find out the unit vector. So what this is doing is working out um, we're creating a benchmark to compare all of the others all, all of the other points from a, from the centroid to this um, axis plane so we're going to connect up all of the centroids of all of the timber mem members to a pulled point on that symmetrical on, on that um, axis line and each of those will have a direction which we're going to determine here and we're going to, we're going to compare that with wh whether or not it's on the right or the left of our symmetry point so let's pull these points this is a geometry wants pull and we want to pull it to the curve here we go so that's all been pulled to the curve 
I have missed something out here though. I haven't added in the plane. We want the plane to be up here, don't we? We want all of these points to be at the top. There we are. So now the points we're looking at and comparing are moving from that location to that location. And each of those will have a direction. If I create a line here that starts there and finishes there, I hope you'll agree that each of these have a direction. They're either going from left to right to connect up with our axis or they're going from right to left to connect up with our axis. And if I make that a unit vector by just plugging the line in, then we have uh, the ability to compare whether or not it's um, moving from right to left or left to right and sort them out. So let's just label these this cluster of elements find lever arm components. Oh, I'm not typing am I? Find lever arm components. Okay and now we just need to determine which side of the tipping point the centroid is on don't we? We've got these two vectors, this one and this one, and we need to know which side these are on. So let's subtract. And if I subtract this vector here, from this one and find the absolute value. If the vector, if the unit vectors are in the same direction, then we'll have zero. If they're, uh, sorry, if they're in the same direction, we'll have a value of two. And if they're in opposite directions, we'll have a value of zero. So let's put in less than, smaller than, And just to give a bit of um, uh, just to give a bit of flexibility, put in 0 0.1 here. And if we place a panel, we'll be able to see what's happening. Okay, so we've got a bunch of true or false booleans here to tell us whether or not the vectors have been aligned or not, and we can dispatch using that. The list we want to dispatch is all the distances. These are this is the key. This is what we're trying to really ultimately get to. We want to know should the distance be applied on the left or right. And remember, we were work, we're working in meters here again. So let's type in an expression of x over one thousand. Okay. And the dispatch pattern is here. Right, so let's now find the weight of each of these components. Type in divide or division. Taking the volume of each of those timber elements. And we're going to type nine, uh, 1 E9 because we're converting from millimeters cubed to meters cubed. Here we are. Now we have the volume in meters cubed. Um, in meters cubed. Okay. And then we want to multiply this by the density of timber. There we go. Multiply that. What should we set it as? 3,700. Oh. Let's press enter. Density of timber in newtons per meter cubed. Great. Apply that into B. And then we get the weight of the material. It's 
in Newton's, which is the last step. Right, let's group this and name it sort weight of each timber element. depending on position to tipping plane relative to tipping plane. Okay, so there's one more thing we do need to add in here and that is a dispatch. So I'll just copy that. The same logic applies and we're going to put in the weight though as the list rather than here where we had the distance. So we've got distance and weight which is what we need to find the lever arm isn't it? Uh, why don't we select this unit, this, this component, right clicking the group and click add to group because that is actually really part of that group. And there we are, we'll follow through to look at the stability results in the next tutorial.